Hello and welcome. Thank you all for being here today on this March 15th, 2022. I am Nick Kenoki, the Director of Technology for the Asset Leadership Network, and I'm very excited for today's program, Sustainable Value Creation from Infrastructure Asset Leadership. And we're starting with the Michigan Infrastructure Council. But before we get underway, I just want to note that this is a big event starting right now that goes until, you know, four or so this afternoon Eastern, and then continues on tomorrow. Uh, so lots of programming. Hopefully you guys can see as much as you're able. Uh, and we just wanted to note that this is about people. You know, we are so excited to be involving so many people in this two-day event to talk about how we can get the most value for the nation um, uh, through our infrastructure. And really, it, it takes champions like uh, you will see here today to get this message to where it needs to go. Uh, before we begin the event, we just want to thank our patron members, uh, as well as our organizational members. We couldn't do programs like this uh, without their continued support. Uh, and we are very grateful for that um, so that we can keep bringing the conversation to a new level. Uh, and with that, I will pass it off to Mike Bordenero, Executive Director for the Asset Leadership Network, to talk a little more about uh, what, we're, what we're doing today. So oh, thank you, Nick. Nick is our Director of Technology, and uh, he is uh, core uh, to this. So thank you, Nick, for everything you do. Of course. And um, uh, you're right. We are very excited about elevating the conversation. And with uh, the involvement of the Michigan Infrastructure Council, I think we are bringing asset management to a whole new level in the United States, or at least as far as our organization is concerned. It was um, through the Government Finance Officers Association, where our um, board member, Mildred Chua, was on a panel with Ian Cranston that we found out about the Michigan Infrastructure Council. And uh, Ian, so thank you for that. And because of the connection from uh, Ian, we have Ryan LaRue, who is the executive director, John Weiss, from the, uh, who's the chairman, Aaron Kuhn, executive director. And they're gonna be giving a presentation and talking about all of the activities that they uh, have going on in Michigan and they're open for interactive uh, discussion. So uh, please keep the uh, questions coming. And I'm really excited for this. So I'll just be quiet now and hand it over to, uh, who should I hand it over to? Who's gonna be starting? I can kick it off. Oh yeah, or Ian. Yeah, yeah, so great to, uh, great to be here with everyone and, and bring this team from Michigan together to share some of these messages. Uh, Mike and I have had a number of discussions over the last few months about uh, how to best share some of the work that's been going on in Michigan with other uh, parts of the US, other states, so people can see some of the steps that have been taken over the years. Uh, I think you'll see, you know, as you hear from John and Aaron and Ryan on this, like this doesn't happen overnight. You know, these are things that, that take time and take steps to, to move forward and make progress. Uh, but uh, yeah, really excited to share what uh, what they've been doing um, over the years to to move forward with their journey. Nick, why don't you uh, put up the first slide? So I, we each of us can sort of introduce ourselves, but it helps to understand where we come from, to know where we started this journey. Um, my name is John Weiss. I'm chairman of the Michigan Infrastructure Council. I'm also executive director of the Grand Valley Metro Council. Uh, Grand Valley Metro Council is an organization, a council of governments in Western Michigan that has uh, 40 members, represents about 750,000 people. And we are the um, metropolitan planning organization for the region, as well as we have a GIS computer system that service all GIS needs for 19 customer communities and we um, handle environmental issues along the Grand River, which is a, a major river that, that bisects across the state of Michigan. So those things coming from a background, I uh, was a president CEO of an architectural and engineering firm. 
I chaired a county road commission, which in Michigan is who are responsible for all roadways that lie within counties outside of, of organized cities and villages. And I um, have been an elected official and a city manager. So my background has been around cooperation, collaboration for 40 years. Erin? Yes, I am Erin Kuhn. I am a uh, voting member appointed by the governor to the Michigan Infrastructure Council. I am also executive director of the West Michigan Shoreline Regional Development Commission. We are um, also a council of government uh, regional planning agencies for five counties in West Michigan represent a, representing 120 local units of government. We administer programs in um, economic development transportation like John's agency. We are also the Metropolitan Transportation Planning Organization for our region. Uh, we have a large scale environmental program as well. And we um, also do local government services. So we help um, cities, townships, counties with any planning needs like master plans, recreation plans. And uh, we also manage GIS within our region. I'm gonna kick it over to Ryan. Thank you, Aaron. My name is uh, Ryan LaRue, and I am recently appointed the uh, executive director, director of the Michigan Infrastructure Council. And my training, uh, historically, I'm a civil engineer by training, but um, have spent the better part of the last decade working in the utility space, primarily looking at long-term planning for both electric and natural gas distribution systems here in Michigan. So uh, just three weeks ago, I took the helm of the MIC and decided to bring my talents in long-term planning to other uh, asset um, ownership and different models of uh, um, you, uh, infrastructure ownership throughout Michigan. So relatively new to the position, but I have also served on the MIC as a non-voting member for the four years prior to my appointment. So not completely unfamiliar uh, waters for me, but really excited to be on board with a great group of members and membership and really push forward this mission of a sustainable infrastructure build out here in Michigan. Nice, mm -hmm. and yeah, so I, I run IC Infrastructure. Um, we're really passionate about helping build capacity. So helping infrastructure owners and governments put in place programs that will help build asset management awareness and capacity to allow infrastructure owners to do more themselves. So we've been working with MEC over the last few years. Um, you'll hear about some of the things that we're gonna talk through in terms of the different tools that have been put in place. Uh, we're program manager with the Canadian Network of Asset Managers as well. So a lot of educational programs up in Canada that we've been heavily involved in. And uh, yeah, great to, great to be part of this collaboration with, uh, with Mick. And uh, yeah, you'll hear a lot more about that just now. Great, mm -hmm. if we could go to the next slide and John, I believe you have this one. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a little history of the Michigan Infrastructure Council, which was the first group that then Governor Snyder appointed to, to in March of 2016. And this we've certainly learned is a journey um, uh, we have a lot of elected officials that are looking for fast results, and, and this is a journey. And the journey is one that uh, Aaron and I have been on for a long time, as well as Ryan in a diff the different role that Ryan had with the Michigan Public Service Commission. But uh, the Michigan Infrastructure Council was charged with analyzing the state of Michigan to determine the scope of the infrastructure in the state, the providers of those infrastructure, and then some, some um, needs assessment. And so they looked forward, they looked at the state. You can see from this slide, we have 617 road agencies. We have 205 or six of those that represent a hundred miles of roads or more. So Michigan is, is a unique in its, in its uh, layout in that we have a large population area that crosses the state uh, from the Muskegon area south and then over to Detroit. And then we're a pretty rural state. So we have 79 transit agencies, 1,080 wastewater providers, 1,300 drinking water providers, 10 natural gas utilities, 59 electrical utilities, um, broadband providers, we have 43, and then 83 drain commissions. And so you can see that what the Michigan Infrastructure Commission found, or the council found at the time, was that 3,350 asset managers. 
So we're looking at ways that we can get people to work together as well as develop a 30 year strategy for all sectors of working together and cooperating together across that path. Uh, next slide. I want to jump in real quick here, John, um, as we move on as you know, as a result of this report from the, um, the commission, they identified 110 um, recommendations that came out of this study, one of which was to create a Michigan Infrastructure Council. The other one was to create a pilot project that would look at how can we gather data and is the data out there and how can we gather it on an aggregated basis that makes sense across the state, which led us into the next slide, which John will also talk about. Okay. so. Governor Snyder wanted to do a pilot because one of the things that the Michigan Infrastructure Commission requested as a recommendation is to determine if data, information, as-built conditions, um, criticality, all of those issues could be gathered. Just frankly, is it available? So he offered two areas of the state Southeastern Michigan, which you can see on the map, and a large West Michigan region that Aaron and I uh, worked in. He had also, a couple of years before, uh, made some changes in state organization and found, created 10 regions in the state to work on infrastructure, also reorganized state government. And so if you look at the West Michigan region, at one time we had 80 boundary lines in that. It was called the spaghetti map because you could live in one area and across the street and you're both cherry farmers, but you have different offices serving you just because that's the way it developed. So he created what the, he called these regional prosperity initiatives, which Aaron and I co-chaired um, for many years. And then he divided this pilot into two parts, Southeastern Michigan, which is all urban and Western Michigan, which is the mix of urban and rural. And what the governor asked us to do is to gather as much information as we could over a short period of time to determine the current condition of Michigan infrastructure, noting that a great deal of our population and our public services are on Southeastern Michigan, but West Michigan in that region that you see on this map really represents Michigan in terms of population, economics, rural versus urban, and a lot of other characteristics to see if we could capture those. We have governmental units that have 500 people and we have them that have over 500,000. So it's what are the differences in the way that we could collect data? Is it even available? Aaron and I tell a story a lot when we make this presentation. We went out to gather what we could and my office because of our GIS work has a huge amount of information on utility systems and, and public work systems right here. We already have it, but we went out looking for Bob. And who's Bob? Bob is the guy that's been a public works director in a small community for most of his career. And all of the maps and all of the information and all of the utility data is in his head. And when Bob dies, so goes the information. Well, we found Bob. Bob's real name was, wasn't Bernie? Barney. Barney. Bar Bob was Barney. That happened. A small community had a long serving public um, works director who had everything in his head. And he had a heart attack and passed away. And that city lost its information. The it was a village and it lost its information. So we wanted to work on that. So the governor asked us to go out and collect this data. Some of it was easy to get, some of it was already available through the state. Others of it, we had to, <laughs> thanks for the comment, sorry to hear about Barney, that's, that's pretty cute, Mike. Um, we were sorry too, in fact, we actually gave them a grant through our Regional Prosperity Initiative to be able to digitize on GIS their system, which was made it a lot easier for them. But Anyway, we went out to gather this information just to see what was available. And you can see from the slide, we gathered 13,000 miles of wastewater pipes, pipe data. It was 535,000 pipe segments, 6,700 miles of stormwater, 14,800 miles of drinking water, 4,800 bridges, 23,000 miles of road. 
And we have a process for collecting road data in the state already, so we use that uh, again. 14,000 culverts, 69 subject matter experts were involved. And again, we took two different approaches. The west side of the state had 32 boots on the ground, DPW directors, uh, utility directors, plant operators, city managers. The eastern side of the state used consulting engineers. So totally we had 69 uh, subject matter experts involved. We did 95 maturity assessments, which just to determine how they were in the asset management process. How were they working together? Uh, were they following what our common understandings of asset management? We did 12 stakeholder meetings, 150 coordination communities participated. It was actually 155 at the end where cities and communities gave us their information. Um, so you can see there was state departments involved in this and we gathered this information covering these communities just to see what it would tell us. Where was Michigan? How were our roads? How were our pipes? How old are they? Could we gather them? Erin used her staff to go out and actually take pictures of as-builts that were hanging on walls in DPW offices. We found metropolitan areas that had still had service line information on cards and card systems, just a wide variety of data. But we wanted to do this assessment in April of 17 on what the infrastructure needs were and whether the, the collection of the data was even possible. Aaron, you were there. Ryan, you were part of this. Do you have any comments? Before yeah, I just it was it was a great it was a great process, and really just having those conversations about how we have historically managed our infrastructure, and having communities tell us, like you know, the Barney situation, where we don't know where our infrastructure is, and when we have a water main break, we document it so we know. Where, where the pipes are in the ground. And that's kind of how they, they've been managing it very reactively. So looking at how we can shift that culture and bring in asset management principles to help, again, build that culture and have a better, better handle of, of how these small communities can get over that hump and really understand the systems that they have, understand the level of service and the criticality and how they can better work with the, the customers that they have within their communities to provide better infrastructure, reliable infrastructure, and have a greater economic impact within their community on how they're, they're doing all of this. So one of the things I thought about this morning that I, thinking about the pilot, in fact, I read the pilot report over the weekend, again, because it's, it's been a while since I read it. I think the subtle things from a leadership standpoint that may particularly resonate with this audience is that when the governor went on to approach the topic of this, you know, we in West Michigan were given the opportunity to participate, but at the time they wanted us to do a smaller geographical area, the, the three most populated counties. And we told them no. In fact, I told them no. We were going to do it all. We were going to do all 13 counties or we weren't interested because we didn't believe that we could seek what he wanted us to do in looking at rural areas unless we did all of the counties. And he, he committed to that. He also committed to be available and to participate. So when we asked our 32 subject matter experts from you know, some of them were very, very small municipalities and some were large to come to the meetings. We met in the cabinet room outside the governor's office. The governor was available to us. He came to some of those meetings. He dropped in or the lieutenant governor dropped in. They also appointed a state leadership in cabinet level officers to participate in this. So it was a Michigan study, a Michigan pilot that had the support and it was much, much easier for us to go to someone and say, you know, are you willing to drive 130 miles to attend this meeting? Or can you spend this time 
it's the governor that's asking you this, not just Aaron and I and, and the leadership. So they did and they were willing. And then there was countless hours by each of those people to go around and help gather this information from their neighboring communities or neighboring counties where they went in and spoke and asked, will you be willing to give this data to us so that we can analyze our needs in the state of Michigan? So top level involvement was very critical to our success. Another thing that um, we discovered during the pilot is how different everybody collects their data or uh, describes their data. So how many different versions of concrete, if you had a concrete pipe, John, it was like 20, 26 different ways we found that communities um, documented that. So we had to figure out how to aggregate that. So we had one, one definition of concrete or one way that people would enter that into the system. And it was, it was um, very challenging to come, come at it from that point to get everything um, consistent across communities so we could really look at the data. I remember one of the meetings with the governor and he was, we, we, we talked often about this during the process or the Lieutenant governor. And one of the, one of the meetings that we had, I had talked to him about an older community, an old community for the state of Michigan and how they had submitted some data and it was tagged 01. And we assumed it was 2001 and it was 1901. And you know, which is a huge, a huge difference. And we, so we had to go back even to, to know conch, Crete, C, all the different labels. And I think we talk about those later where we had 1500 different labels, but we, to bring those down, but then, you know, I mean, just to his surprise to show the, some of the magnitude of the issue, you may have been very involved in GIS, but if you used acronyms and symbols or dates like 01 or 20. It could be the 1920 or it could be 2020. And then we found some 1800s, some stuff that was dated 99, which we just interpreted as they didn't know the answer. And that was some sort uh, of filler. And it wasn't, it was 1899. So all of that information came together. And then when he would meet with us or when the Lieutenant Governor would meet with us, they'd talk about those challenges. So they were, they, they, everyone felt they were really in tune to what was going on and, and it helped to relate to the people who were um, donating their time because everybody donated their time. And when you ask busy people who are running water systems or sewer systems or communities, to donate their time to these efforts and we're meeting every other week and they do and it's a day out of their time. Uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating whenever they feel like they have the support or they can go back to their bosses and say, yeah, I was in a meeting in the cabinet room today with the governor and he was talking about this vision for asset management in the state, so. And one other thing I wanna talk about is the, um, the state of Michigan, a few years prior to the pilot, had what they called SAW grants, um, and they were stormwater asset management grants, and they funded how many millions of dollars of studies, John? I 562 million. Um, which was wonderful, but they were done on a community by community basis with really no um, consistency on how those plans were put together. So we have, you know, maybe 500 communities that have done, have received a SAW grant and have a very good understanding of their asset management internally, but each plan is very different. So you cannot aggregate them up to have a clear picture of how we stand at, at even at, at a county level, let alone the state level. So this was, this pilot project helped us kind of overcome that and see the barriers that came across from that state initiative to, to really look at asset management. But it really didn't help the state as a whole because each one was so different. And John, I, I know you have some stories on that as well. Yeah, I think, so those grants, they were, they were offered through kind of through a lottery system and they were, um, the cap on them was $2 million. And there was a lot of communities that got $2 million. And my colleague, 
who was chairing the Southeastern Michigan section while I was chairing the West Michigan section, we met and attended um, a conference of statewide consulting engineers and there was about 600 people in the room and we were presenting all the things that we were doing and, and I was highly critical of SAW grants in that the SAW grants really provided no real benefit to the state because of their inconsistency. So I said to the group, I just asked the question, how many of you are following some kind of consistent methodology to do the SAW grants? And somebody yelled from the back of the room, you mean in the office or with a client? And we found out that there may be five, six engineers doing SAW grants in communities, all using different methodology, none of it reportable up to the state in any kind of cohesive manner. So uh, from there, that was a little surprising to the, to the uh, state departments and, and it, it was a miss and it was a big miss. And that information could have been available. People could have chose not to get a SAW grant if they didn't want to report, but everyone got one and the state got nothing out of that other than the fact that people did them. So I think we can move on to the next slide. Or you do, I think this is critical because what we're trying to do is have an impact on the huge infrastructure investment and job act spending and we do not want that same kind of mistake so i wanted to just come in and say federal attendees pay attention to to that and we'll talk later about ways to overcome that but i just wanted to make that point right and i think i think the the important part is you know the communities every community is different so it's really hard to have a a, a cookie cutter you know you must have this this and this in your plan but the, the way they measure the, um, their infrastructure and then, and, the, the, and then report up to the state needs to be consistent. So you can, you can compare where you stand as a state as a whole, but still allow those communities to have the, um, the individuality to be able to meet their local needs but that consistency in rolling up the information. You know, what, what type of, and this is something we'll go into as we go into the next slides, but something that we ran across in the pilot was, you know, really how much, how much information does the state need to know? You know, I need to know uh, a lot about my infrastructure. I need to know when those valves were turned, when, um, you know, when those pipes were last uh, maintained, but does the state need to know that? And, um, John will talk about you know the two questions that we had coming out of our communities and sharing a lot of detail about their infrastructure to the state as a whole. So John, if you want to kind of talk about that, and then we can go into the creation of the councils. Okay, so we, we travel around and I think we had like 20 summits and 2000 people in attendance and then I attended at least 40 um, city council meetings, talking about the work that we were doing and trying to gather information. And we really had a couple of um, concerns that we had to get through. And, and they were concerns for both the public sector and um, we also have private sector. Then we talked to Consumers Energy and DTE, which are the two largest utility providers in the state. And Aaron and I met with uh, presidents of those. So the concerns were, of course, the, no, the normal national security, homeland security, security of data. Um, how is this going to be used? There was the fear of information going public that shouldn't be on critical water systems and, and water intakes. Most of our water intakes here are from freshwater sources like Lake Michigan and, and those pipes are, are hidden from the public and public knowledge. And so there was that whole side of it. How do you protect the data? The second side and the asset management side, which was really interesting is if I am truly a city mayor and, I'm, and we talk to the mayors and we are providing this information and we're going to analyze the data and we're going to rate the data and we're going to know where our needs are from an asset management standpoint. And Michigan has historically operated on a worst first or fix it when it breaks. How now do I make the decision that that project 
that I know will be failing soon isn't going to be the priority for this summer, but this project over here is. And we call that the MLive, which is a, a, a media chain here, the MLive challenge, because you're asking a public official to truly do an analysis of their system, to know information and then make decisions that are longer term asset management based versus greatest threat, first worst based. So we had to get through that. And another surprising thing that I think that we did that, that got a lot of our, our mayor's interest is when we had mayors attending our summits, I would open with the question to the mayors only, what is your tolerance for water or sewer main breaks per month? The answer was always zero, which always then caused the DPW directors and the city managers to drop their heads and know, well, you know, nobody can do zero. So we had to talk through this asset management principle using, you know, a, a worst case scenario like a water main break or a sewer main break as examples and then how do we think about it in longer terms so you know those are kind of the the three threats and it's a big threat because if i know as a mayor that a water main break is you know water main is 110 years old and we've fixed it five times in the last five years is my responsibility to fix it first or to follow asset management principles working groups, do the coordination and the collaboration, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will, and um, take a longer term view. So, and I, Mike, I don't wanna forget your answer, your question about federal money, because I think that's important and we'll get back to it and remind me. So when we started to develop the Michigan Infrastructure Council, Aaron, do you want to do this one or do you want me to do it? Or sure, Ryan? I can do I can do it or Ryan. I, I doesn't matter. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay. Uh, so once we completed the the pilot project, uh, the Governor Snyder at the time created the Michigan Infrastructure Council. And in that slate of bills, he also created the Water Asset Management Council. And in Michigan, we had um, and now it's been 20 years. Um, the Transportation Asset Management Council that has been um, looking at our statewide uh, federal aid transportation roads doing uh, ra a rating system that we call PASER rating. Um, and that council had been around for a while, but he introduced some, some new changes to that council and had all three councils put together so we could work together and really look at infrastructure in the state of Michigan across assets. And that was, that's where the, the biggest, I think, um, benefit we have in the Michigan Infrastructure Council is that we're looking across assets and nowhere in the country is that being done at this large scale. When we were looking at examples of um, how to do this, we had to look to Australia and New Zealand and UK and Canada, which is kind of where Ian comes into play then um, but when we were first getting, getting started, it was the end of Governor Snyder's term. We were, we were having a new gubernatorial election, knew, knowing that we were, he was term limited. So we were definitely going to have a new governor. And we ended up getting, um, having a new governor in a different party, but whose platform was fixing the damn roads. So we knew that our, our governor, our new governor was going to uh, support what we're doing along with the, um, with, along the lines of the Michigan Infrastructure Council. So we had five pillars that we really came up with in our mission, and you can read the mission here, but our five pillars that we as a council wanted to focus on was to educate on our infrastructure, to coordinate making sure that we're, we're coordinating projects, we're saving money, and, and what can we do to um, coordinate the infrastructure, again, across assets? How do we prioritize what we do across assets? And then collaborate. And um, again, this is just working together, public, private, um, again, across assets, and then investing where it makes sense, where we can stretch those very limited dollars that we have to put into our infrastructure. And how do we do that? 
And then how do we work all three councils together to bring it all together? So and before you yeah, go, John go and, and next, Ryan, please yeah. add. Before you go to the next slide, the Michigan Infrastructure Council has nine voting members that are appointed by the legislative leadership as well as the governor's office. It also has representation of cabinet level folks in the cabinet and they are non-voting members. So most of them have their um, chief of staff or their chief deputy. Ryan was there representing the, uh, as a member of the MIC, non-voting member of the MIC representing the Michigan Public Service Commission through his role as the senior staff person for the actual commission. Ryan, you wanna comment a bit on, on the non-voting side of our house? Yeah, sure. Um, it, primarily looking at state agencies and um, much like other infrastructure, the agencies and their policy work had often been siloed. So I think that there was a great opportunity to pull these nine voting, non-voting members into the council and just uh, to once again, collaborate and look at policies that um, just enabled greater utilization and efficiency in the deployment of infrastructure. There was a lot of dollars coming from different agencies for different purposes that were never really connecting within the community or um, provided in a way that um, supported collaboration or provided timelines for collaboration. So bringing these state agencies in that did often um, have the checkbook or have an opportunity to fund some of these infrastructure works and having a seat at the table and understanding some of the concerns that were coming out of industry, I think was key to uh, just better understanding the opportunity that was before us. And um, it's it really opened my eyes and really turned me on to the work and the opportunity that sat before the council while I was sitting as a staff person looking at primarily utilities. So just uh, it was just really thoughtful how the membership was comprised. And I think it really recognized some of the failures of our first build out in infrastructure of not having enough seats at the table and really focused on making sure that our table was full and the decisions were comprehensive and holistic and um, just really appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into the legislature and the composition of the memberships. So I had the opportunity, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I would like to point out, uh, Ryan, that what you were saying and what this slide represents is uh, needs to be repeated throughout the country. Um, your mission, talking about quality of life, talking about education, coordination, whatever, all of these things are critical. And then to show that infrastructure is totally interrelated. And the second side of the slide is spectacular. We're having a, a transportation asset leadership uh, roundtable tomorrow, and I want to steal this slide and maybe one of you to participate in that because I think this sums up so much. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. So when we, when we were going through this process, often state agencies play the role of regulators. And you know, I, I would term it, they don't have a dog in the hunt. They just look for the problems. And part of that was because all of these water and sewer utility systems are really local. And the vast majority of our road networks in our state are local, yet direct funding to road agencies comes from Federal Highway through MDOT and then to us, where that doesn't exist to the same level in the other infrastructure areas. So it was sort of important for us to have people start to understand, if I'm going to share my data, if I'm going to give you my water system analysis of where my strengths and weaknesses are, I'm giving it to you for the purposes of helping you to make the state better, not to provide the regulators a direct link to our insider information. And so that was another one of our challenges with the municipalities was, you know, frankly, I mean, I had one long-term mayor say, why the hell would we give that to them? Well, it's a good question. And so we found ways to gather that information up without recognizing exactly who the municipality was. I think the other thing that we can get from this chart, uh, did somebody, was somebody gonna jump in there? I, or was that just a noise? Okay. The other thing that we can get from the chart is as we looked to the future and I was involved in writing the legislation with 
a couple of members of the Senate and the House and the governor's staff. So one of the big challenges that we had was um, where do we put it? Do we staff the MIC with MDOT people, Department of Transportation people? Do we staff it with Eagle people? How do we staff it? Where do we staff it? And the consensus was, in the end, it's often a financial issue and the Michigan Department of Treasury is neutral. And so we'll staff it there because they didn't really have their own silo, everybody else did. So we made the decision consciously to put this in the Department of Treasury where Ryan is housed as a Department of Treasury employee and a, and a director um, on purpose. So that decision was made to do that. So the MIC has oversight of TAMSI, which is the Transportation Asset Management Council, which has been around for 20 years, and WAMSI, which is new to handle water asset management. And you can see um, the unified cultural asset management and technical common definitions and standards and the strategic initiatives that we have. But the legislation and the governor's decision to put it in treasury was very highly debated and very much thought out. So I'm ready to go on. Yep, I think our, our next slide here is really, really the bulk of what we've been doing since uh, the Michigan infrastructure was created or council was created. We first went around the state. John and I did a lot of uh, dog and pony shows around the state. We had 25 summits, over a thousand people participating in those, really just asking the question, what, what are some of the barriers that you have in managing your infrastructure? What are some of the needs that you would like from the state or um, just that would help you manage the, your infrastructure? And we got a lot of um, really good responses to that. And that really defined our, our pillars and where we were where we wanted to go. Um, first of all, we we contracted with Ian and put together the asset management readiness self assessments. And Ian, I'm going to have you kind of talk about that. Yeah, I'd like to speak about that. So the, the asset management readiness assessments they're based on a tool that's been very successful in Canada. So in Canada, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities produced this assessment tool for communities that's really intended to be this, this quick look, like what is your asset management uh, maturity currently at? Like what are some of the bits that you're already doing? Because uh, we always say like there, there's lots of different things that you need to do in your asset management efforts, but you're not starting from a blank slate. Like As an organization, you're always doing bits of this, and a lot of this is about how we're bringing this together. So this assessment tool was a really great way to try and uh, give, give Michigan infrastructure owners this tool that they could use, a process that they could walk through to gauge where are they at with it, uh, both now and what are the future steps that they want to take. Now, this is a, a tool that's actually on the MIC website, and I'll put a link in the chat, and you guys can go and download that, uh, that Excel tool um, for your own use as well. All right. I think that I'm going to go ahead and take over definitions and standards. So. Um, we've discussed this and it's come up previously in our conversation, but as we set out to create a culture of asset management and sustainability across infrastructure classes, a firm foundation was key to our success. We knew this very early on. And based on our experience from the pilot, our MIC approach, we knew we had to focus on standardizing our approach along with the definitions in order from which we could build. So standards essentially help ensure safety, quality, and reliability of products and services, and they also help with the portability of resources across jurisdictional lines or asset lines, um, in our case, which can increase and accelerate the deployments and simplify the learning curve for collaboration when that time comes. So with this idea in mind, um, the goal or the MIC committed early on to standardizing our language and communications amongst our membership and our stakeholders. So consistency is key here. Our work on definitions and standards provides a commonplace understanding from which the MIC can build and expand on with minimal confusion and maximum efficiency. So with like if you were to go to our website today, you would also find our kind of definitions page, which uh, includes over 1500 infrastructure terms and mutually under and that are mutually understood by our membership and across the asset classes. 
and the crossed asset owners that are represented on our board. And this all really is planned to increase our efficiency and make sure that we are talking apples to apples at the table and being able to, at the back end of this, do that benchmarking that Aaron had mentioned will be so important because we will be looking at apples to apples information. So the really the definitions and standards was just gonna be a really key component of making sure that we got something out of this on the back end and we didn't have 15 different or 1,500 different plans, all referring to concrete in some different um, form or manner, as we had uh, learned earlier in some of our pilot programs. So with that, um, I'll, I'll do dig once. Okay. So um, before I do, Mike, just one comment that you made about having top leadership. The first meeting of the MIC, when we sat around the table, the first meeting and appointed, I appointed committees, I appointed myself and our vice chair to a committee with our state employees, our state leadership folks from the cabinet that were on. And I met with them and I said, there's only one thing I ask you to do is you all work for the executive branch. I don't. I can say things you can't. Call me up. We'll talk about it. And I'll raise your issues to the leadership of the state. You don't have to do that. And that has helped many times where people have called and they're having an issue and I can put two departments together without having to go to the executive branch and raise an issue. So I just wanted to get that out while I was thinking about it, Mike. So one of the things that we heard from, not only from municipalities. That's leadership, John. That's really yeah. good leadership. Well, yeah. I, I told them before I started this journey, I was going to retire anyway. So I had nothing to lose. <laughs> so. So, uh, so it is okay. So, okay. all right, cool. One of the things that we heard about a lot is coordination and collaboration. And Aaron and I are all about that, and we do that every day. And that's something that I've done my whole career. So, we developed this idea to do this Dig Once portal. And the Dig Once portal would be an early warning device, uh, a methodology that people could put their utility projects in. Generally, those are those that are involved in the right of way. And those who are around them can also get involved. Now, we control a great deal of funding for roads in our agencies. And we know that by working together with water and sewer, we can move a project from one year to the next so that we're not digging multiple times or replacing that road network multiple times. And that's really important for us to have the Dig Once portal. So we have 13,000 projects. We've been open a uh, year March 6th, I think it was. 13,000 projects, they involve private utility companies like DTE, and we have some, some broadband providers and, and consumers energy, and municipal projects and water, sewer, and roads. And what happens is when you're registered for one of those, as one of those industries in your region, and you decide that, you know, next year, and we ask for five years, and we understand we had to get through this a lot, a long time, with highly regulated uh, utilities, that when they tell the state of Michigan they have a capital improvement program, the state of Michigan expects them to do that capital improvement program the year they said they would do it. So we said, well, let's know for sure next year and let's look a little less accurate at the next year. And maybe if we're talking five years out, we're only 40% right, but we're still more right than we are right now, not knowing. And Ryan helped feed that initiative through the Public Service Commission so that if one of our utilities, you know, one of my water systems over here wants to do a project in a certain block or for a certain half mile, they plug that into the portal and everybody else that's in the portal will be notified of that in advance. So, you know, in terms of early warning device, it's an early warning. The utilities know, the public sector knows, the, the, the utilities that are privately held are knowing. So now we can start to coordinate our projects together. So we're only replacing the road once. Talking to the engineering folks at the large utility, the private utility companies, they told us if we would know that, then we could maybe work together to replace lines or to uh, remove lines and allow the pipe to be used as conduit, those sorts of things. Um, and then of course we had problems like in, in tourist areas that have very short construction seasons 
where projects weren't notified and roads were torn up to do utility projects or to do private utility uh, energy projects. So let's coordinate that all together. And that has been one of our strongest projects that we've worked on and we're continuing to grow it. We're continuing to make it more advanced, but to know that people are willing to participate at that level and it's the side of save money is the same as making money. And it's a way to keep people from putting their hand out and saying, you know, we can fix all problems. All we need is more funding. It's a way for them to get more funding by working together. It's also a way that a bit forces everybody to work together so there are no surprises, which is one thing that we've had before. Governor Snyder and Governor Whitmer were both are both very concerned about. Um, if you guys have any comments on that, otherwise we'll move on to the champions. Yeah, I think for the sake of time, we'll move on to, to champions real quick and then on the strategy and then open it up to questions. So I chair the asset management uh, champion program and work very closely with Ian on, on this program. We ran our first uh, champions program this time last year. We kicked off in early April last year. We had 78 graduates. And this program is really the, the program that has helped us build that culture. So how do we, um, we wanted to make sure we were working with um, folks that, that hands-on with, with asset management or with these um, private utilities and, and public utilities and, and get them all speaking the same language and understanding what asset management is. So we, we partnered with, with Ian's group and we had the 78 champion, champions um, and I'll let Ian talk a little bit more about the detail of that, but um, I just want to touch very quickly on the AM and the AM and um, the new program starting in April, Ian, and then you can kind of go into the details. But we also recognize that our private vendors, the private engineering consultants, really are um, a, a very good connection to a lot of our local smaller communities that don't have the, um, the capacity to manage their own infrastructure. They, they have these consultants on contract with them that um, help them manage their infrastructure. So we really needed to reach out and have a connection with them in um, not only um, um, understanding what we're doing at the MIC, but also helping them, um, giving them access to the self-assessment so they can bring that into their communities um, that, they, that they work with. And that's been great. And now we are getting ready to kick off a new program of asset management champions coming up here in April again. And I believe we have um, between 80 and 90 people signed up for that and more on the waiting list uh, wanting to do this program. Ian? Nice, yeah. And, and the program itself is split into a few different parts. So there's a component of it that is e-learning. So it's self-paced uh, training that people go through. And again, leveraging some of the content that's already been produced in Canada. Uh, that's been a partnership with the Canadian Network of Asset Managers. Um, so yeah, some, some content there, it's e-learning. There's then these learning pods that we host. So alongside the e-learning, we get together for some live discussions and that's all been virtual. I mean, you're covering the state of Michigan. There's a lot of people in different geographies. So we get people together and have these learning pods of smaller groups. Uh, and that's been really exciting to have some kind of smaller discussions with some of these groups, talk through some of the content, talk through some of the individual challenges that they're having. A uh, third part of the program and, and one of the big objectives is creating this network of champions across the state. You know, how can you, you bring these people together so that they can help their neighbors, so they can help their peers, uh, building those relationships and, and seeding those, uh, those connections has been really important. So that's been a big uh, thing that's been, uh, that's been developed through the program. Uh, and then the fourth component is around uh, industry learning. Uh, so through part of this, the champions have also been given access to uh, the Canadian Network of Asset Managers uh, learning library and webinars. Uh, they get access to their uh, annual conference and things like that. Uh, again, helping build more awareness, uh, seeing some of the success stories that are out there and, uh, and helping you know, build this, this knowledge. Um, a lot of that champion program is gearing up towards uh, 
all the knowledge that you need to conduct these self-assessments, you know, the, the detailed and, and the, you know, the change champion aspect of, of being a champion. Uh, what are those steps that you need to take? So there's a lot of um, support in there for those champions and, and going through that journey and having those discussions with their organization and, and getting their organization excited about asset management. So you're turning it from, you know, training one champion into changing that, that as an organization and moving that organization forward. Yeah, and we had um, our first 78, we had a wide variety of individuals that participated in that. Everything from the, the practitioners, boots on the ground, to city managers, DPW directors. We had state employees, regional uh, representatives. We had even some elected officials that participated in the program. And it, and it really, again, helps to build that culture, not only at one level, but at multiple levels, because it really takes a whole organization to implement asset management. So John, do you wanna talk about the 30-year strategy? 30-year sure. strategy is one of our legislative requirements. It's something that we just kicked off. The first meeting was last week, uh, Thursday. The, the MIC, we did an international RFP for assistance in this, and we got uh, several proposals. Um, we picked a team that was an international team led by WSP, which is a consulting firm here located in the state, but Ian's on it, as well as colleagues from Australia, New Zealand. And, and so we're beginning this 30 year strategy um, in developing how do we mold together a strategy that involves 3,500 private uh, asset owners providing public utilities with the state of Michigan and all of its needs and handle issues over the long term. And so we're, I was in meetings on this this morning and we're just working on it now, but it, it's one of the pillars of our efforts is the development of this 30 year strategy. And we're very pleased uh, to have Ian and his colleagues from around the globe working with us on this effort. Probably next slide. And that just brings us to questions. So that's it. Lots of uh, lots of content through there. So hopefully that gives you guys a good uh, picture of what we've uh, we've been through. Uh, Mike, how do you do? You have any kind of questions you want to go through, or people you want to call on? First of all, I've got to pick my jaw up. I don't know how you hit every note and to end on the 30 year approach that is spectacular and um um before the slides go away nick can you go back to i believe it's the second slide that talks about the pilot and the numbers are impressive in the pilot uh, the next that one yes what are the numbers now because this is now statewide, right? Yeah, but we haven't gathered. We've, we've moved from this assessment that was done as a snapshot in time over, um, our governor used to talk about everything was in dog ears. So he gave us uh, like seven months to do this effort and to see what we could gather. And we've sort of shifted this collection of information for now over to the pilot, over to the, um, the portal, which is why we have the 13,000 projects in the portal. This is an assessment of the condition of existing at that time from these select communities or these yeah. select regions. Okay, uh, so the one of our goals would be to continue that statewide. Right. right. And and really, when, when the governor, after the pilot, then created the Michigan Infrastructure Council and the Water Asset Management Council and the Transportation Asset Management Council, those two um, other councils, TMC and WAMC, are really charged with the data collection. And they're, they're in the process of doing that. Now, on the transportation side, we've been collecting this data um, for um, federal aid eligible roads for 20 years now. Uh, and we, we have that data, we, we know what that data says. Uh, we are now in the process of, of collecting additional transportation data, including local roads that are not eligible for federal dollars. And, yeah. and so that, that council some agencies, is really charged with that. Some agencies have though, uh, our, our agency, we've collected 
for our community's local road data for for 12 years. So so we have that. Other other areas have as well. You know, one of the things I think, Mike, we can leave you with when we did this is our partner on this. Don't leave. We've got this set up to continue to flow into the next oh, okay. program. So I, Don't I leave. understand you have other obligations, but I, stick I'm good for a while as much as you want. Okay. Nick, you can stop sharing this set of slides for right now. Okay, let's stay with this. Carmen Palumbo, who is a guy who'd been in transportation asset management at Simcog for 40 years, I think. In fact, we have an asset management statewide award that's got his name on it. Um, the Carmen Palumbo Award, he used to tell us almost every meeting that we had, we're not going to get this right. We just got to make progress toward right. And we'll figure out later as we go what right is. And that's one of the things that we've had to spend some time with, with legislators and with elected officials and with local units is, you know, as we move on this journey, and I stress that word a lot, journey, we know there will be changes and we know that we're gonna get some things wrong. Sort of our goal in like gathering data is not to ask you twice. We wanna get it once and we know that that's gonna take an effort on your part. I mean, and then earlier we were talking about, about state support. There are times and I'm sure all states do it where the state of Michigan um, Department of Environmental Quality at the time would ask for reports. And there was questions whether anybody even read them. So I went to the governor and lieutenant governor and got permission to have one of the communities who chose not to do it, submit a nice title page and a bunch of nothing in the middle as their report, just to see if anyone would notice. And we didn't do that, but I think it was, it, it just showed that we as a body, as the MIC, are asking for information. We owe it to people to use it and for them to see how we're using it. And then they're more willing to participate. And that's why we have 13,000 projects in a year, because people can see it. Well, uh, this is just spectacular. Um, we're going to, uh, for production purposes, introduce the next speakers, but we're going to, the idea is to have you engage with the next speaker. So uh, please don't go away. Um, Nick, if you want to put up the um, slides and I'll start talking about this next ses session, which is the discussion on this really spectacular presentation. I'm just, I'm, I'm blown away. So um, we have asked some of our uh, favorite uh, people from the Asset Leadership Network to continue the discussion um, on what you've presented. And uh, in that, we have uh, Hugh Sinclair, who is the uh, uh, asset manager for, well, first of all, let's thank our patron uh, members for making this uh, uh, possible. And we also want to thank our uh, um, organizational members. And uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to do this. And thank you for that spectacular presentation to all of you.